Phyllis Bennis is a fellow with the Institute for Policy Studies. She's also the international advisor to Jewish Voice for Peace. And she's joining us live from Washington, D.C. It's always a pleasure to have you on Al Jazeera, Ms. Bennis. Thank you for your time. So the U.S. administration's reaction to Nasrallah's death is in line with their stance on Israel's actions since October 7th. But given that it looks like Israel has broken several laws in its operation to kill Nasrallah, how much do you think will the U.S. lack of acknowledgement of Israel's conduct, let alone criticism, only embolden Israel, which is already doing whatever it wants? Well, I think, Elizabeth, that what, we, what we're seeing is very much what we've seen for almost a year regarding Gaza. The United States and its president says one thing, says we need a ceasefire, we don't want to expand the war, but the actions are what Israel is responding to. The mm -hmm. actions of the United States, the actions of President Biden, are to continue sending weapons and money that enable the genocide in Gaza and the war that's increasing in Lebanon. So sending 2,000-pound bombs, that's what was used apparently in the assassination of Nasrallah, uh, and sending B-15 B planes to drop those bombs, apparently those were the planes that were used, uh, that is the message that gets through to Netanyahu and to uh, the rest of the Israeli leadership. It seems that what they say does not matter because what they do doesn't yeah. match what they say. It's so different, isn't it? It's really interesting, the points that you're making about the possible uh, U.S. weapons being used in this operation, because we do believe that civilians have been killed in this operation, which is a clear mm -hmm. violation of international law. And again, on your point about the words not matching the actions, it's clear from the U.S. actions that it doesn't care about tens of thousands of Palestinian civilians, including children being killed. But is there anything about a wider regional war that you think would force the U.S. to use the leverage it has with Israel? Would U.S. interests in the region be threatened by a wider regional war? I think it all comes down to how we define U.S. interests and U.S. Uh, protections in the region. If you accept the notion that the interests, that national interests of the United States are bound up with expanding the military presence across the world, then it's a good thing that they are already having 40,000 U.S. troops in the region and are now sending more troops. We don't know how many. We know there's now two aircraft carriers in the region. There's a new submarine that's been sent, and there are U.S. bases throughout the region. So that expansion of U.S. power uh, is part of how people in Washington tend to define what is a U.S. interest, what is in the interests of this country. For those of us who don't think that the military approach has any potential to actually keep anyone safe in this country or anywhere else in the world, it's a huge problem. It's not a solution. But this is what we're now seeing as the U.S. response. We're hearing, again, calls for ceasefire at the same time that the U.S. is now sending U.S. troops, as well as continuing to send more weapons. Just yesterday, the White House approved uh, the, the, the use of another $8 billion worth of weapons that are now being approved to be sent to Israel immediately. So all of the talk about ceasefire means nothing. It means nothing as long as they continue to send these weapons and now send troops. Do you think that this U.S. administration wants a bigger military presence in the Middle East? I mean, this is the same administration that had mm. that disastrous withdrawal from Afghanistan precisely because it didn't want such a presence right. in the Middle East. I think that overall, ironically enough, I actually think that President Biden does not want to expand the war. And I think he is somewhat concerned about the conditions facing Palestinian civilians in Gaza. The problem is his concerns don't matter if he doesn't ask, act on them, and he's not acting on them. I think right now, the and, and in, earlier in Gaza, what we are seeing is that the commitment of this administration and the commitment of President Biden indi individually to Israel in, in this broadly defined way of talking about the defense, which, of course, as the occupying power, Israel does not have a, an Article 51 right of self-defense in the way that a country would if it was invaded by another country. The U.S. has seen that same problem with, with Afghanistan. But in this context, I do believe that the administration, including President Biden, would prefer not to see this war expanded. But they are not willing to stop providing all the weapons that Israel wants 
including the most lethal forces in the U.S. arsenal, these 2,000-pound bombs, F-15 and F-16 warplanes, all of those things. Yeah. They're not willing to stop that. That's the only way that the call for a ceasefire can be made real. And the whys of that need a whole nother discussion, but we'll run out of time. Ms. Bennis, thank mm -hmm. you as always for your analysis. We really appreciate it. Phyllis Bennis, Bennis in Washington, D.C. Thank you.